the optimism of the early spring of 2023 has given way to quite a lot of pessimism, frankly. Um, the Russians have got the upper hand or are getting the upper hand. They've got the strategic initiative in the east. Uh, the Russians are able to build up capability, lost capability, quicker than the Ukrainians. They're replacing their ammunition. They've had over a million artillery rounds, 155 or heavy artillery rounds from the North Koreans in the last, uh, in, in the last uh, since August last year, in the last nine months or so. Um, and Ukraine is suffering. Ukraine is finding it very difficult to hold against the Russians. We saw the failure of the much vaunted Ukrainian counteroffensive last summer and late spring, which in my view was over -opt There was a huge degree of over-optimism largely put about by Western media. Uh, and the reality being, of course, that without air power, without the capability that the West needs to provide to Ukraine, it was never going to succeed. Uh, but the Russians are moving forward. Set against that, there have been some remarkable Ukrainian successes. I, for, I would highlight, for example, Ukrainian neutralizing the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol. Uh, and to do that without a navy has been really clever by the Ukrainians. They've used drones and long-range precision missiles. Um, so there have been real successes there. Uh, and, they are fight and of course, Ukrainian hits against uh, Russian energy infrastructure as well. Uh, but I think we have to be pretty gloomy about the prospects for Ukraine this year. And it all comes down to the West not providing the capabilities that Ukraine needs. Ammunition, equipment, long-range precision missiles. Of course, the $60 million package in, the, in Washington has been stalled by the impact of Trump on the uh, American run-up to the American election. And unless Ukraine gets the kit, the ammunition and the long range missiles that it needs, it is going to continue to go backwards. And that is really bad news. Jim, we'll just go back to the situation on the front line in Ukraine at the moment. It was interesting that General Budinov, Ukraine's General Budinov, did an interview with German television, I think, recently, in which he said that he anticipates a fresh Russian offensive in the late spring, early summer. As things stand, given what we've been discussing about the need for more supplies for Ukraine, how do you think they will cope with that? How do you think Ukraine will, will, will stand up to that offensive? Well, with difficulty, unless they're given more, uh, exactly as what we've been talking earlier, exactly as I said at the start of the discussion, unless the Ukraine is given the capability to withstand that, the ammunition, the long-range precision missiles, the, the, and, the, and the military equipment to, that they need, uh, they will find it very, very difficult. And if that happens, if there is a Russian counteroffensive in the spring, late summer, unless Ukraine is given the capabilities, I would anticipate potentially significant amounts of uh, Ukrainian land being, being captured again by Russia. That's very interesting, because actually what we've seen in recent months, yes, Russia have made some small incremental advances, for example, capturing Avdivka, but actually we haven't seen any significant breakthroughs. But you think that could that could change in the coming months if we're not careful? I wouldn't rule anything out. I think the Ukrainians will hold extremely effectively. What I'm saying is I think potentially there could be more land recaptured by Russia. Uh, whether there's a major breakthrough or not depends entirely, again, comes back to my point earlier about giving Ukraine the means to defend itself. But more than that, the means to ultimately defeat Russia. And we're a long way short of that. I mentioned General Budinov a moment ago. Of course, we, we have seen some changes in the Ukrainian military leadership in recent months. General Zelushny has been replaced by, by General Sersky. Have you noted any change in Ukraine's operational strategy since that, that transition? Um, I think it's difficult to, from, 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 the, you know, from this, this distance to, to, to comment on that. But what I would say is it's entirely understandable to replace a, a senior general uh, who has carried the burden of, of the defence of Ukraine and, and, and achieved extraordinary successes uh, in the early, early months of the war, two years on. I mean, people get tired and, 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 and maybe fresh thinking is needed. But what you've got to be so careful about is widespread movement and removal of personnel, which disturbs the balance, disturbs the teamwork, disturbs the dynamic of headquarters uh, and can cause a degree of chaos, confusion rather than uh, where you need to ha you need to manage it. Can any any manpower changes carefully? And whilst Ukraine is in this difficult position of waiting for fresh Western military aid, 
what realistically is their best strategy? I mean, they have had success, as you mentioned, General, you know, it's been phenomenally successful in terms of um, eliminating much of the Black Sea fleet around Sevastopol. Also, we, we've seen some of their attacks on Russian energy infrastructure, Ukrainian drone strikes um, on Russian oil refineries are reportedly now forcing Russia to import gas from Kazakhstan. So they have had some really significant success. What do you think is their best strategy for the coming months, given we have this impasse with Western military aid? I think, uh, if I, I know again, I wouldn't second guess the Ukrainian command, but if, if I think if I was in that position, I would be, I would be seeking, looking, looking to hold on to dig deep, literally dig deep, uh, build defensive capabilities, build defensive fortifications, strengthen my defense in order to allow me to build up capability, to train uh, with new equipment, new capability, to bring new equipment into service and to build up with a view to launching offensives further downstream. But the absolute priority is to hold. And General Sheriff, just to go back to Donald Trump and, and what effect he may have on NATO, and I appreciate a bit like it's almost impossible to read the mind of Vladimir Putin, it's almost impossible to read the mind of Donald Trump, but do you think he would withdraw America from NATO. It's something that has been speculated on. He did an interview recently in which he appeared to deny that. But do you think we should be making preparations for potentially the US withdrawing from NATO were Trump to be re-elected? I think you have to think of, assume the worst case and be, be, be pleased if the worst case doesn't come about. Um, I mean, the reality of an American withdrawal from NATO, yes, America, the NATO, the alliance may be able to future proof itself in the ways we've discussed earlier. But the bottom line is this, that the alliance would find it, the European members of NATO and Canada would find it really, really impossible, difficult, if not impossible, to fully replace all the capabilities that America brings to the NATO party. So what? So, so start preparing, start thinking about it, start putting together. It comes back to defense spending and, and building and multi-year contracts and building up your military industrial complex and capabilities. Um, would it go all the way? Well, it might. Uh, but even if Trump does, uh, I think I think there's a high chance that he, even if he doesn't pull America out of the alliance, America would become a sort of sleeping partner in the alliance, mm. still in the alliance, but not exerting the uh, providing the full the full suite of American capability. Still able to influence things there, and that's obviously something we would hope for. 